So chapter one is entitled The Study of Life. That's just another way of saying biology. It's an introductory chapter, and there are a few things we're going to go through, including some study objectives, which are going to carry us not only through this chapter, but into some of the future chapters. So on the first slide here, you have the study objectives. These are very good tools for practicing or checking yourself when you're preparing for the exam. But there are a few things here that are going to be true for the whole course. So one of the things you should be able to do is recite the definitions, or at least know the definitions of all the vocabulary. This is something I actually think is very helpful to do before you go to lecture or listen to a lecture if it's an online class. And I think that's true no matter what class it is. If you know the language before you go to the lecture, or if you at least know most of the language or have a good sense of the language, you will get so much more out of the lecture and the instructor can actually help you make the connections with all of these words that you're going to learn and that helps you learn them even better. Um, we're going to go through the rest of these objectives in chapter one and I'm not going to read them to you because you can read. The other thing though that's going to apply to the whole course is down here, skills for the entire course. I'd like to help you learn how to ask better questions um, for when you need clarification on the material. So instead of just asking, saying to the professor, I just don't understand any of it, finding the point at which you get lost and saying, I understand this, this, and this, but then here's where I get lost and this is where I need to help, you need to help me, or can you help me make a connection or you know, what's the, how am I supposed to see these two ideas um, together or whatever, but, but be very specific about where it is that you get lost. So I would start with the laying out what you do understand and then the instructor can then see where it is that they can help you. Um, I'm going to help you learn how to think like a professor when you're preparing for a quiz, test, or exam. And again, providing these study objectives is really a big part of that. Um, and I am going to teach you a little bit about how learning works, how your brain works. When you're learning something for the first time, it's it'd be a little bit like if I told you my phone number and then you didn't write it down or anything and we came back the next day, if I asked you what my, you know, do you know my phone number? You probably wouldn't because you didn't write it down, you didn't really think about it too much. So, you know, I might have told it to you, but you didn't learn it. And so the first step of learning is just hearing the information, but then there has to be some practice. You would need to maybe write it down, go home, maybe spend some time quizzing yourself, like looking at the, at the number and then practicing it without looking. And so the same kind of thing has to happen in, in a science class is that, you know, the lecturer is going to um, tell you a lot of stuff, but it's only going to tell it to you once. And you have to go home and rehearse and practice it over and over to make it stick and to make it um, stay in your short-term memory and then eventually long-term memory. It's really the goal. And so we'll be working on those kinds of things. So, so like I said, in addition to all these study objectives, we're going to, what, one thing you're going to see going through this course is a focus on the vocabulary because that's really a, a huge piece of it and then some other skills that will weave into what we're doing in the course. All right, But come back to this slide when you're getting ready for the test and this becomes a good review um, for you. All right, so the natural sciences. We usually split this up into the natural sciences, the big heading, and then it splits up into life sciences and physical sciences. Life sciences is biology and the different fields of biology. Physical sciences include physics, chemistry, and so on, uh, geology. And so, um, so in this course, we're going to be, you know, over here on the life science side of this. And then you will probably be taking classes on the physical sciences side of things, depending on what your major is. But all of these together are called the natural sciences. I'm not sure what the unnatural sciences <laughs> might be. Um, maybe technology and tools that humans make. I don't know. But 
we call biology, physics, um, chemistry, geology, we call these the natural sciences. So here's our first little list of terminology. And you'll see if you study them ahead of time and then listen to the lecture, it, it will help. But you have to start somewhere. So I think starting with the terminology is a good way to start. Um, if you always study vo the vocabulary list from a textbook before you went to the lecture, I think you'd be surprised how much of it makes sense and how many things you'd be able to put into place during the lecture in your mind. So the terminology is, the vocabulary is always a big piece of this. And I, I picked out some these words, but, I, you know, I'm, I'm basically curating what I think are the, some of the main um, terms that you need to know. So what is science? Science aims to understand the natural world through both observation and through reasoning and experimentation. Not all science has to be an experiment. So observation is very important, just to see what's happening. The scientists who studied how honeybees communicate with each other just watched them, just watched them a lot, and they figured out eventually how the bees were communicating with each other. So that's not an experiment. That's just observation. So they, they watch and watch and watch and watch, and... Um, figure out that certain things mean uh, certain dances that the bees do have certain meanings. But it's not particularly a science, it's not particularly an experiment. In fact, the bees didn't even know they were being watched, probably. Um, and then there are things that are more clearly experiments. So that would involve something called the scientific method, which we will talk a little bit about for sure. So in the scientific method, you have a hypothesis. Well, really, you have a question. So you're in, you're in the world, and you come up with a question, something you don't know. And your hypothesis is what you think is the correct explanation for that uh, phenomenon. And typically, what you would do first is go to the library and see if anybody's answered that question already. What's the body of research, and is there an answer, you know, a reasonable answer to your question? Sometimes there is, in which case that's it. You don't need to do an experiment. But let's say you come across something that nobody's ever figured out, and so then you have, maybe you make a hypothesis. The hypothesis has to be testable. There has to be some kind of test that we can all agree on that's reasonable uh, in science that, that is, uh, makes the hypothesis testable. And the hypothesis must be what we call falsifiable. There has to be some kind of result that would cause us to reject the hypothesis and some kind of result that would cause us to um, believe that we support the hypothesis. But it has to be a fair test. That's what we usually call it. Um, and then when you complete the experiment, you might you might support your hypothesis, or you might reject it, or you might support part of it and reject part of it, and then you can sort of modify it and test it again in a new, in a new modified version. An experiment is designed to only test one variable at a time. That's very important. The variable that's being tested, there can only be one thing that changes in the different groups. You have a control group, which demonstrates kind of a baseline measurement for the experiment. And then you have other groups where you add in a certain variable and see what the effect is on those results. If you, don't, if you have more than one variable that's changing during the experiment, then, then we say that you're not controlling the, all the variables. You can only let one variable be different amongst the groups. If more than one variable is different amongst the groups, then you can't really interpret your results it becomes almost impossible to have a reasonable interpretation of results. So when you design the experiment, there has, you have to pay attention to keeping most things the same from one group to the next and only changing one variable. So what's a theory? The word theory in casual, um, in the casual meaning, in the slang meaning, it implies um, just a guess, something you you know, what you think might be true. That's a slang definition of the word theory. 
So people use this all the time. You know, I have a theory that my friend is, you know, is going out with my ex-boyfriend or I don't know, just, it usually means something that I don't really know, but I, I have a, I have an inkling. I might know, I'm guessing the real, the scientific meaning of the word theory is virtually the exact opposite. It means a lar a concept that is so well supported that it's as close to being a fact as what we can reasonably come to. Um, so it's very, a very certain thing that is very well supported by lots and lots of evidence. All right, so it's interesting how a word can have in, in different contexts two different meanings, really. In this class, we're only going to use the scientific definition of the word theory. In science, the main goal really is publication. You you have questions that you do research to answer those questions and when you make a significant contribution to the field of science you publish that result and that conclusion and so publication is how we communicate with each other one way that we communicate with each other we publish in what are called peer-reviewed journals journals are it's like a magazine but we call them journals that's where you're your research um, um, articles will be published. And in biology, the premier journals, the highest, most respected journals are called Nature, Cell, and Science. And these are also called high impact factor journals because they affect more people look to these journals than other journals for, for what's, you know, what's really cutting edge, what's really reliable and, and important breakthroughs. There are also middle impact journals or medium impact journals, impact factor journals, and those are good too, but uh, I just listed the three that are the highest impact, the most prestigious. When you publish in a prestigious journal, the article must first be peer reviewed. That means they call on another expert in the same field of science that you're in, and those people look at your um, pub the manuscript the draft of what you think should be published and they might make suggestions they might not but it takes a couple months to get the peer review process done and so you might not get your public your your paper published until you know four months even up to a year sometimes they ask for additional data to be produced and and those kinds of things so they can ask for revisions as well any time that you do research just for the sake of knowing the answer to something, it's called basic science. Sometimes we call it pure science. So there's a lot of things that people study. You know, the venom of cone snails. Um, just everything to know about a cone snail, you know, was at one point a basic science. I'm just giving you an example. But it turns out that they found that some of the components of the venom in cone snails could actually potentially be and eventually were shown to be useful in medicine. So they didn't know going into the study of cone snails, there's a scientist who just likes to nerd out on cone snails and they study them, you know, and then they kind of stumble across or figure out or notice that something that they've come across is useful to humans typically. And so at that point, some part of basic science kind of transfers into what we call applied science. Applied science is where they use something that you have found in basic science, use it to develop something that's really useful typically to humans. And so you need a big, broad underpinning of basic science and then some things within that will become much more useful and we can kind of pluck those out and see a way to use them to create a product or do something medically with them. Not all basic science though is useful in that way, but you just have to start investigating things before you'll, you're going to be able to stumble across some of those um, really particularly useful pieces of knowledge. So basic science comes first and then applied science is sort of born out of some of the basic science. And don't underestimate the role of what we call serendipity, lucky, a lucky accident or a surprise. 
Um, serendipity would be when you stumble across something that you weren't expecting. Now, nine times out of ten, in my experience, when you stumble across something, you're looking at some results and they weren't what you were expecting. What you do is you repeat the experiment, you know, ten times to, to make sure it's reproducible. And typically, when you re repeat the experiment ten times, it turns out that you made a mistake on that first one. So a lot of times the, the thing that you think, oh, what is this? It turns out it's because you messed it up a little bit. But if you repeat it at 10 times and you keep getting that same result, that same unexpected result, well, then you've discovered something new, maybe, that nobody's ever figured out or seen before. And so you have to be able to recognize and to, to test and see if you have found something new and then go from there. So things, sometimes you think you're on this path of, of research and you get switched into something else somewhat different because you found something that nobody's ever seen before and so you follow it. Um, and so that's serendipity, but you, it's not complete luck. You have to know, you have to be able to recognize it when it happens and know what to do. So, but yeah, if you stumble across things, you get lucky sometimes. That's what we say. Um, most journals, like I said, when you publish in a journal, they have a certain format for the manuscript, for the draft of the, of the article. And sometimes that's called MRAD. MRAD is just an acronym. I stands for introduction. M is for methods, R is for results, and then the little a is for and. And D is, excuse me, discussion and conclusions, but we don't put the C for conclusions, MRAD. It's really just the format of, of a journal article, and it would be the format of a lab report if you were going to write a lab report, which you may be required to do in some classes. So you start with an introduction. The introduction is all the things that came before, all the research that you and other scientists have done in this basic field of research before. So kind of a, a background, a, a synopsis, a recap. Then the methods is what are you going, what, are, what did you do in this particular research project? Results is what are, you, what are your numbers, what's your data, what, you know, what are your results? But no comment on that, just the numbers, the data. And then discussion conclusion is your interpretation of the results. So it's a very standard format for a journal article. In addition, they have an abstract. Now, in art, abstract means something completely different. But in writing an article, the abstract is the summary. And the summary summarizes everything in only about five cent, you know, maybe seven sentences. So it's a very condensed summary. Most scientists don't have time to read the whole article, but they might read the abstract and just get the gist of what, what's new uh, this week in science. So we don't tend to have time or even interest in every article in a journal, but we might locate a certain article in a journal and read the abstract. And if we really are interested, if it's really affecting our research area, we might read the whole article. But we rely a lot on the abstract. And then references are all the um, citations to all the previous work that's been done and previously um, published. All right, so journal articles are the primary source of information for scientists. All right, we will do some work with journals looking at just some basic, just getting our hands on journals and looking at them and just, just extracting them, some very basic things, just getting familiar with what a journal article might look like and what an abstract might look like and, and the high level of the language that's used. The language in a journal article is the high, really the highest level that, um, that we have in science. So it, it can be a little bit of an obstacle as a, when you're a student, but, um, but you know, just looking at them and getting the gist is typically good enough for us starting out. So we will look at some of those and just kind of get a feeling for journal articles. That's the primary source for science. All right, so in this list of terminology, I want to go over quite a few things that I've already discussed. Let's see if there's anything in here that I haven't discussed. That looks pretty good. So, you know, study your terminology, look through that. Um, the next part of chapter one, and when I give you a list, I typically will tell you whether or not you need to memorize the list, because memorizing lists sometimes is important as a part of the process of learning, but sometimes it's not helpful at all. So and this one says don't memorize. You don't need to memorize this. The properties of life, the way that your book lays it out, um, 
is this little um, bulleted list. And different textbooks have similar lists, so it's, it's not um, all that unusual of a list. But I want to point out the few things in this course that are going to be really important to us. One of them is going to be order. We're going to talk a lot about how things are ordered or structured. What is the organization of biology? I don't mean biology as in the course, but I mean like the, all the molecules and structures of life. What is the order and the structure? And then the, we will talk about some of these other things, but the other thing we will spend quite a bit of time on, which is probably the what you might think is kind of a, I don't know, students often think this is kind of a boring looking one, but energy processing. So those two things are going to, in my opinion, big topics in this course. Then when you go on to the next course and the next course, you, you apply those concepts more so to some of these other areas. Now, I'm not saying we're not going to talk at all about these other areas, but there's a lot of focus on order and there's a lot of focus on energy processing. Okay, um, We will talk a little bit about cell division, so technically that's gives you some reproduction in there, but anyway. So as you go on into more biology classes, you start hitting more and more of these topics, um, but we do start a lot doing a lot of, of discussion of the order and the structure of life. All right. All right, the hierarchy of biological organization. This list you do need to memorize, and it, the terms are on the vocabulary list as well. So you need to memorize the definition of each of the terms, which are shown on this slide in boldface, and you also need to know the order in which they go. I think of the hierarchy as starting, um, like this picture doesn't really um, reflect it, but I think of the hierarchy as starting down low, like the atom, which is not even on this list. The atom is the smallest unit of chemistry, atom, oops, I don't know why my mouse does that. And then after atom comes molecule, you'll notice my, my mouse does this all the time. And then after molecule comes macromolecule, macromolecule. And then after macromolecule comes organelles. So there's a few things. These are probably more in the, in the chemistry realm over here. But really, I think of things starting in, at the atom level. Atoms joined together by bonds to make molecules. Very large molecules are sometimes called macromolecules or biomolecules. The, many of those come together to form structures, small structures inside of cells called organelles. Organelles all together make up a cell. And many cells of the same type form what we call a tissue. Many tissues of the same type form an organ. Many organs working together in a system, sorry, not many tissues of the same type, many tissues of different types form an organ. Organs of different types form an organ system. Organ systems, and one thing they kind of left off, organ systems together make up the single organism. And then after organism comes population, it's a group of organisms of the same species. And then communities would be a group of different populations of different species. And then ecosystems includes not only the communities of life, but also the what we call the abiotic, the non-living parts of that region. So that could be soil, temperature, water, air quality, those kinds of things. That's the whole ecosystem. And then the biosphere would be the sum total of all the ecosystems on Earth. So in my mind, you start at Adam and then you kind of work your way up. But that's just my mental picture of it. No matter how you learn it, you need to learn it in order. But each, each category encompasses groups of the previous category. Okay, so that's called the hierarchy of biological organization. And here's the list in alphabetical order of the definitions that would work um, as you're studying this. All right, but you'll notice that each one, when you put them in order, 
each one is really um, consists of multiples of the previous group. So the unity and diversity of life. Unity means all together and diversity means all different. And the unity of life is the idea that all life originated from a single, well, we can't say for sure single event, but that all life had a common origin. That maybe there was one cell or one, we don't know what that first thing was. But all life came from kind of the same beginnings. And that was probably just a single cell or a couple cells. And that as those cells um, replicated and reproduced, I should say, and became and divided and became more of them, that some of them became a little bit different genetically and, um, you know, in terms of characteristics, and that they continued to multiply and become different. And over time, some of the organisms became multicellular. And eventually, this process went on for 3.5 billion years that you have the earth as you have it now with the organisms you have now which are quite diverse but when you look now at the at all the organisms on earth we all track back we all are connected by that original event whatever that was we don't know in science what that was um, or exactly how that looked but there's a lot of data that supports this that all life connects back to the same beginning and but now life is you know is has diversified all right originally they had grouped organisms into um, the unicellular organisms and then the eukaryotes that was the old classification system for organisms basically the bacteria and then the everything else um, that was the old system that they had but it in, in the 70s, there was a scientist named Carl Wosey, that's how his name is, tip, is commonly pronounced. In the German, it would be different, but let's just go with Carl Wosey. Um, he studied the RNA in the unicellular organisms, and by that I'm talking about these groups, bacteria and archaea. And what he found was that they are quite different from each other, and so he was responsible for separating the, that one group into two. So now we have what we call the domains. One is called bacteria, one is called archaea, and then the other, the third domain did not change. It's called eukarya. Okay, and so the, so that's who Carl Wosey was. He started to study the RNA of, of different um, organisms and came up with a, slight, a, a different scheme for the classification. So this is what we have today, the three domains. So bacteria, you probably have some idea what bacteria are. They are unicellular. That means that in the hierarchy of biological organization, which we looked at on the previous slide, when you get to that level of organ of cell, and you remember that above cell would be tissue and organ and organ system and then organism, for the unicellular organisms, there is nothing in between. The cell is the organism. So you kind of splice all that middle part out. The cell is the organism and then you go to population after that. So the unicellular organisms don't have tissues. They don't have organs. They don't have organ systems because the cell is the organism. So you bring those two things together. So unicellular organism, the whole cell, one cell is the whole organism. Uh, eukarya some of them are unicellular, some of them are multicellular. So like humans, we're multicellular. There's about 20 trillion cells in a human. That's a guess, but it's, it's pretty, pretty good. Pretty good guess. No, it's not my guess. But that's the estimate that, that they have. Um, then you have this issue of prokaryotic and eukaryotic. The, um, a prokaryotic cell, all cells have a cell membrane, ribosomes, We'll talk about those a little bit later. Cell membrane is sometimes called the plasma membrane. And then some DNA. All right. Sometimes it's organized in what we call chromosomes, but some kind of mass of DNA. Now, prokaryotes, the DNA is just kind of floating in a little tangle inside the cell. But in eukaryotes, the DNA is surrounded by two additional membranes. So not only do you have the big cell membrane, but within the cell you have a smaller, two smaller membranes. It's like a double bag. 
to protect the DNA. And when you have those two membranes surrounding the DNA, we call that structure the nucleus. So eukaryotes have a nucleus, membranes that surround the DNA. Bacteria and archaea do not have a nucleus. They have DNA, but it's not protected or surrounded by its own special membranes. And so those are called prokaryotes. That's fundamentally the difference between them. However, the size is also much different. If you looked at a eukaryotic cell under a microscope, and you had a prokaryotic cell on the same, in the same field of view in your vision, the prokaryote is very tiny compared to the eukaryote when you compare cell to cell. So when we um, typically, you, you often get a chance to look at cheek cells under a microscope. You know, you take a swab from inside your cheek, and those would be human cells, those would be eukaryotic cells, and sometimes you get a little bit of bacteria, maybe you had some yogurt for breakfast, and sometimes you can see some bacteria, and the differential in the size is like, so here's a, oh, let me draw it over here, here's a eukaryotic cell, here's the DNA, here's the nucleus, and then the prokaryotic cell would be like right here. You won't be able to see much detail in it. So the size, there would be a big size differential, so size is a big difference. And there's other differences too, but the main thing is if the DNA of the cell is surrounded by its own membrane, we call it the nuclear membrane, nuclear, then um, it's a eukaryote. If the DNA is not surrounded by its own special membrane, it's, just, it's a prokaryote. All right, a little bit more about taxonomy. So we talked about the three domains, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Each domain is subdivided into kingdoms. So kingdoms are the smaller group within the domains. So for example, in domain eukarya, then there are, there's actually several kingdoms, but the three main ones are called planty, animalia, and fungi. There's more kingdoms, but some of them are really, they only have like one member and such. But the big three are plantae, animalia, and fungi. So, so, and then each, like plantae, is subdivided into different phyla, which is this here. Animalia is also subdivided into its own phyla groups, and then uh, fungi. And then so each phylum is divided into multiple classes, and each class is divided into a whole bunch of orders, and each order is divided into families. Each family is divided into many genes. Uh, we say genera is the plural of genus. And then each genus is divided into many species, typically. And so, so every organism has all of these groupings. There's a committee called the International Union of Biology that decides on the groupings. So it's not up to you, but that's decided by committee, literally by committee. And um, so for humans, we are homo. You don't have to memorize this, but I just want to give you an example. We are homo sapien. Homo is our genus, sapien is our species. And the important thing about species is you can um, breed with anyone in your own species. And there's some additional rules to that, but I'm not going to get delve into it. But breeding is, is the main thing. And, um, but we have other names too, because we are in domain eukarya. We are in kingdom animalia. Our phylum name is called chordata. You don't need to write that down. Our class is mammalia. Our order is primate. Our family is hominidae. Our genus is Homo, and our species is Sapien. So we have a classification in each of these, you know, larger groups. But species is the most specific. And in fact, the word species comes from the same root of the word specific. So for so the species is the most specific grouping. Right. And then I have one more thing I wanted to add in this chapter, and this is just a more of a conceptual thing. In science, we use a lot of models, and models include diagrams, like in your book, um, three-dimensional objects that we might have in the lab, maybe a plastic model of a plant cell or something like that, 
Computer programs can be models, and in the online classes, we use more of the computer models. And math, math equations can model certain events. And in, in this course, we're going to see probably more diagrams and three-dimensional objects. They're especially problematic, especially in the textbook, because, first of all, you don't get a sense of scale. And models are meant to teach something specific, but they're not meant for you to take other meaning from them. And that can be confusing to students when you're not, you're not familiar with any of it. So I give this, this example. This is a model of the human heart. And right here is, this is the right atrium, and this is the right ventricle, and this is the left atrium, and this is the left ventricle. And if you look, this model is meant to teach you the order in which the blood flows through the chambers of the heart. However, you are not supposed to take any other meaning from this. In other words, you are not supposed to assume that the heart is a square, and you're not supposed to assume that part of the heart is blue. So there's things in here that, uh, if you're not familiar with it at all, you might extract and think that that's also meaningful, but in fact, it's not. And so as much as possible, it's my job to try to foresee those kinds of things and point out what meaning you are supposed to be getting and what meaning you're not supposed to, you know, put any importance on. Because actually blood is never blue. And we use the color blue sometimes to distinguish parts that carry blood that has oxygen and parts that carry blood that does not have oxygen, but blood is always red. And we can talk about that later. And the other problem I mentioned is with scale. When you are dealing with things in your world that you know, that you're familiar, your brain can see a picture on a piece of paper and immediately know the scale of that item. And it helps you, it helps your brain to integrate things in. However, when you're looking at something brand new in science, especially things that are very small, you might not have a sense of how these, the size of objects compares to each other. So I give you this, this series of pictures. On paper, in this picture, the item that appears to be the largest is Dwight Schrute, the bobblehead. And the item that appears to be the smallest is the bathroom sign. And you know that because, oh no, you know that, um, but if you, if you know in actual life that, that the largest item in actual life is the man, Troy Aikman, the best quarterback ever, and the smallest actual object is, are the game pieces, all right? So you wouldn't know that just by looking at this picture though, right? You would only know it because you can connect each of these to something that's already in part of your experience. So when we're looking at something in the book, sometimes they'll put a picture of something and they'll have another picture separate from it next to it and it makes it almost look like they're the same and yet sometimes one of them is quite bigger than the other in real life and so that's my job is to try to help you put them in a, in a spatial organization in your head. Which one's bigger, which one's smaller. This one is big and it's inside of this other bigger thing and you know so get getting that all straight. 